Despite strong video evidence, a jury acquitted a man accused of beating and shooting at a San Bernardino County Sheriff deputy back in 2019. Welcome back. I'm Giovanna Lada. I'm Mark Brown. You're watching Eyewitness News at 5 live on ABC7, Hulu, and wherever you stream. A former San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputy is shocked after a jury acquitted the man charged with her attempted murder. Our Inland Empire Bureau Chief Rob McMillan has more on the defense's claim that she wasn't lawfully performing her duties prior to the attack. At first glance, the video might seem crystal clear. A suspect punching a San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputy several times, stealing her gun, and then firing as she runs away from him. However, a jury has found Ari Young not guilty of both attempted murder and assault with a firearm on a peace officer. The jury apparently didn't even have enough evidence to find him guilty of resisting arrest, battery on a peace officer, or even for removing the firearm. On those charges, the jury hung. I roll onto my hands and my knees and I look up at him and he points the gun at my forehead and pulls the trigger and I hear the trigger click. And I had so much pain to my face from, you know, being punched so many times, I thought I had been shot in the head. What's up, guys? Welcome to the ACIP Podcast. My name is Bauer Brown, co-founder and lead instructor of ACE Interdiction Tactics, one of law enforcement's fastest growing training companies in the nation, specializing in bringing our cops some of the best proactive training. If you have not checked out any of our classes, go to aceinterdiction.com, look at the list of classes that we have coming up, get registered and make yourself better. Welcome, everybody, to the ACIT Network podcast. I'm here with co-founder of ACIT, Albert Clark, and joining us today is Megan McCarthy. Megan, thank you so much for being on. We really appreciate you doing this. Thank you guys for having me. I'm honored. Well, I just have to tell the story of how I came across your situation, which we're going to get into in this podcast, but I'm scrolling through Facebook and I see, I think it's an Instagram reel or something or Facebook reel. I can't remember which social media platform I was using. And it played the video of your incident where this guy takes your gun and tries to kill you and i'm like this is one of the most horrific videos i have ever seen and i didn't know at that point that what they were about to say was even more horrific than that and it was the fact that this dude goes to jury trial and is acquitted and i was completely completely mind blown so immediately i reached out to you thinking there's no possible way she's going to hit me back and uh agree to be on this and you did so i'm so grateful for that and i just have to say that what you guys are about to hear, like this story, is one of the most mind-blowing things I have seen in a long time. Would you agree? I would agree. It's uh, it's absolutely terrible. It is. So before we get into that, Megan, if you just want to introduce yourself, tell us a little, about, little bit about you and kind of what started your law enforcement career. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not very exciting. I, I wasn't the person that grew up wanting to be a cop. I actually was in nursing school. And one of my friends said, hey, Megan, you should come for a ride along. Like, it's kind of cool to see this side of the community. And I said, OK, sure. So I went on a ride along. And I think maybe an hour into it, we got into a pursuit and it was a felony traffic stop. And it was, you know, like the perfect law and order scene, you know, like it was crazy. And then we also saw a side of the medical. So we responded to I think it was a car accident and you're able to help people. And then the softer side where you're meeting with people that were just an unfortunate victim of crime. And that's when I left that uh, right along saying, I think this is what I want to do. Like it kind of dabbled in the medical. I, I like that. I like the community involvement. So a couple months later, I was in the academy for my local department and the rest is history. So tell us a bit about the time frame when you became a cop and tell this incident happened. Were you enjoying the career? Is this Was this felt like the right career choice for you? Yeah, so I went through the academy in January of 2016, and then I graduated in June. And the way my department worked was when you graduated, you went to a custody setting. So I went to our local jail. I worked there for about three, four months. And then I went to our classified, um, our centralized classification unit, which is like our in-house jail team. I did that for a few months, and then I eventually went out to patrol. And I cleared FTO, I want to say, June or July of 2017, and I loved it. I genuinely loved it. I was fortunate enough to be assigned as a school resource officer. So I had six elementary schools that I was responsible for. And that was the hidden gem. I, you know, I love the pursuits. I love the running gun. I love the chasing bad guys, but it was honestly connecting with the kids 
and being on that side of the community, that was my heart. I woke up every day excited to go to work. I knew that I was going to spend the next 30 years of my life doing this job. And then September 4th, 2019 was the day of my shooting. So I was a little tiny baby deputy. I had just over three years at the time of my shooting. And the area I worked was the city of Victorville, which is ranked the number nine most dangerous city in all of California. So we saw a lot of action and it was a pretty dangerous place. But yeah, I really didn't expect that September morning to happen. Absolutely. Interesting fact about Victorville and that you bring it up as such. Um, when I started working interdiction full-time back in 2016, the very first load of drugs that I had on the interstate was from Victorville. Shocker, right? <laughs> Not surprised. Can't say I'm surprised. <laughs> I'll never forget Victorville because I remember looking at his license and seeing Victorville, asking where he's coming from, Victorville. I'll yeah. just never forget that from, wow. from till the day I die. Victorville. So that's interesting that you say that. So let's talk about kind of the morning leading up to the shooting and this incident. Um, well, before I ask that question, let me ask you this. You said you're a school resource officer. That means you're going to be out with the community quite a bit. And one thing that we've seen as we've taught across the nation is the area in which you work dictates basically how well the the public treats you. So for example, the area which we work is a very good area. I would say that we are treated very well by the majority of the public where we're at. And then we'll teach in some areas, we'll ask that same question. They'll be like, absolutely not. We're hated here. Nobody likes us. Um, you know, we get water bottles thrown at us. It's just, you know, crazy. What was the feeling with you being that SRO with the community? Did you feel like you had the support of the community most of the time or was it the opposite? So when I work patrol, I would say you kind of had a mix. We have a pretty high homeless population here. We have a pretty high homicide rate. You know, we have the high crime areas. But as a whole, I would honestly say that the high desert and Victorville weren't all that bad. I mean, yes, you have your neighborhoods, you have your pockets, you know, if it's 1am driving down a certain street, you can probably get a pretty good stop. We all have those areas. But when I was a school resource officer, my schools were awesome. You know, we had the typical CPS sex abuse reports that would come in. But as a whole, the parents were excited to see you. The kids loved to see you. You know, the community was very supportive. I would go to school district meetings and they would always hold the door for you and be excited to see you and appreciate the fact that you were there. Now, I will say, I think 2020 was a gigantic shift in law enforcement. So I can't speak on it since then. Like I said, September 2019, we still had a little bit of the, you know, contention, but it's nothing like it is now. So I do think that Victorville has changed, but at the time of my shooting, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that time of the shooting. If you want to bring up, um, <clears throat> just talk about, you know, that morning and leading up to it and your call and basically brief us on the incident and then we'll talk about it. So June of 2019, the school year ended. So I went back to patrol and that's how I ended up being at this call for service. I took the month of July off for vacation because the school year had ended. So I was about two months into my new shift on patrol and I worked what we called AM1. So it was your day shift during the week. And I want to say this was a Wednesday. It might have been a Thursday. I can't really remember. But we had just left briefing. My husband, he was my boyfriend at the time, but my husband now had worked a triple homicide the night before. So I actually went home. I lived, I don't know, five minutes from the station. So it wasn't far. And I just grabbed a cup of coffee, said hi to him. And little eerie fact is my husband's on the SWAT team. So you know, he would we would go to the range often. We would shoot. And we had shot the weekend before. And I had, you know, reloaded my duty ammo and my gun was ready to go every morning. I press checked it, made sure if something happened, it was ready. So for the first time ever, when I went home that day, he said, let me see your gun really quick. And he press checked it himself. And I said, why'd you do that? And he's like, just in case. And I kid you not, 30 seconds later, the call came over the radio for my call. And it came out as a priority to unknown problem. It was a mom on the phone saying, oh my God, oh my God, get my son out of here. And there wasn't too much information being given over dispatch, but I was heading back into the city and I was right down the street. I really wasn't far. So I said, go ahead and send it to me. It was actually my partner's beat. So I covered the call for him. And as I'm driving en route, it gets bumped up to priority one. Mom stops responding to dispatch and 
we can hear a commotion in the background, but you can't make out what's being said or, you know, what's going on. You can just tell that there's something going on. So I respond, I park, you know, two houses down, I make my approach and we had a suspect description of a, you know, black male adult wearing a white t-shirt and that was all I knew. So as I'm walking up the driveway, I had just crossed the threshold of, you know, like the driveway and the cul-de-sac was the very end of a cul-de-sac. And as I'm walking towards the front of the house, the front door flies open and out comes a suspect matching the description, walking straight towards me. You know, we've locked eyes. He is beelining it straight towards me. And right behind him is mom holding a large butcher knife and still on the phone with dispatch on the other. So he walks straight towards me and you know, based on our training and experience, I can tell that this isn't going to be like a, Hey, what's wrong? You know, let's talk about it. He was very angry. He was very aggressive. His fists were clenched. His, you know, chest was puffed out. So based on my reasonable suspicion, I conducted a detention. I tried to pat down his pockets for weapons. Mom has a knife. I'm thinking, okay, something had happened. She's armed himself herself against him. The minute I place his hand to the small of his back, I'm telling him, relax, relax, talk to me what's going on. He tells me, if we fight, I will kill you. And I'm like, you don't want to do that. You know, just trying to de-escalate, you know, those fancy words that they use these days. And I'm patting down his pockets and I have his hands in the small of his back and I had just, you know, put them together and I'm holding onto his fingers. And he tells me, I'm going to headbutt the fuck out of you. So I go and I kind of step offline because obviously if he headbutts me, I don't want to be right there. And as soon as I shift my body weight, he spins around and he grabs onto my left wrist and he will not let go. We're tug of warring over my hand. You know, I start giving him the commands, get on the ground, stop fighting, let go of me. I move on to trying to do defensive tactics, trying to leg sweep him, get him off balance. I try and do, you know, the rear wrist lock, get his hands behind his back, something, nothing is working at this whole time. He has my left hand. And the way that I had my belt set up is my taser was on the far left and I couldn't reach it across my body. So I go for my RCB, my baton, and I, you know, rack it out and I tell him I'm going to hit you and I go to hit his leg and he grabs it from me and throws it. So now I'm thinking like, okay, this has escalated into a full blown fight. This whole time mom's been on the phone with 911. So dispatch is hearing all of this. So I put out, I'm 415, which is our signal for I'm fighting. And when we're fighting, he grabs my bun on the back of my head and he pulls me down. He starts trying to knee me in the face. Well, when he does that, my earpiece ran down my back to my radio and he disconnected it. So everything I was trying to put out to dispatch wasn't going through. So I try again, put out, you know, I'm 415 because I'm like, why am I not hearing anybody? Like, where's my partners? And so then we start full blown fighting. He's punching me in the face. I'm trying to punch him. But this whole time he's holding onto my wrist at that, this point, he has broken my thumb. So my wrist is kind of useless. So when the video kicks on that you're referring to, we had fought for about three and a half minutes before then. And, you know, still going through all the commands, nothing's working. He had punched me so many times in the face, he broke this bone. And I can feel myself losing the fight. Like I'm seeing the tunnel vision, I'm starting to lose like the fine motor skills, like I can feel my body starting to block out. So I pull out my gun. And that's when you hear me on the video say I'm going to shoot you. And my logic is, I'm trying to give one last ditch effort of de-escalation. You know, I didn't want to have to shoot this person in front of his mom or just shoot a person in general. If I'm a reasonable person being told by a cop, I'm going to shoot you, I would probably stop. You know, maybe it was just the heat of the moment, whatever. Trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Didn't work. Made him more angry. Then he overpowers me. We fall into the ground and I take aim at his head and I miss. And then he traps my arm into the ground like this. And now we're fighting over my gun. So he had positioned his hand where it was in the trigger guard and wrapped around the slide. And we discharge around into the ground. He's able to take my gun from me. I roll onto my hands and my knees and I look up at him and he points the gun at my forehead and pulls the trigger. And I hear the trigger click. And I had so much pain to my face from, you know, being punched so many times. I thought I had been shot in the head, but I'm like, okay, well, my heart's still pumping. My legs are working. We got to get out of here. So I turn and I run. And that's when he shoots at my back as I'm running away. So miraculously, the dispatcher knew I wasn't responding. Luckily, it was early morning. That was the only call for service. She sent the cavalry to me. And as soon as I'm running for cover, my partners come down the cul-de-sac, take his attention, and they get into a shootout with him. He gets shot. He's taken to the hospital. I'm taken to the hospital. 
And the kind of crazy part of all of this is when we had fought over my, my gun, the way his hand was on the slide, it caused a stovepipe. So the round wasn't able to be ejected. And that's the only thing that saved me from being murdered that day was my round didn't eject and he didn't know it. So you can see him on the video, clear the malfunction and then shoot at me. So, you know, obviously awful situation. We never want our equipment to malfunction, but in this case, it saved my life. That's a, that point that you just brought up was one of the things I was going to ask you about because on the video, uh, you see him clear the malfunction. And for those of our listeners who aren't law enforcement, like a stovepipe malfunction, ultimately, like uh, Megan said, the shell doesn't fully eject from the slide or the ejection port. And they're unable to, the firing pin is unable to connect, obviously, to the uh, inserted round if there is one. And so for him to have the state of mind, for you to get up and run, for him to know that he pulled the trigger, it didn't work. And then for him to clear the malfunction and shoot at you a second time after a first attempt failed is just mind blowing. That shows that he was trying to absolutely kill you. Like there's no, <laughs> what other proof do you need that he was there to actually kill you than everything that you have? Did you know, how long did it take before you found out this situation was on video? I remember laying in the hospital bed and, you know, CSI is coming in there and they're, you know, swabbing my hands for DNA and they're taking pictures of my injuries and they're doing all of this. And I remember my sister and my husband were standing there and people were talking to me. And then all of a sudden it got kind of like weird and everybody's looking at their phones. So I think it was like an hour, maybe not even then. And my sister comes up to me and she's like, Megan, it's on video. I'm like, what's on video? She's like, what happened to you? And I said, well, at the time we didn't have body worn cameras. They have them now. And I'm like, well, how? Like there wasn't surveillance. And she's like, the upstairs neighbor, he posted it to YouTube. I'm like, great. So now dealing with what just happened to me, now I know the world is about to see the worst thing that has ever happened to me. And I think within 24 hours, it was viewed like 13 million times. So blessing and a curse that I was caught on video. But and the end result, it really didn't do me any good. So <laughs> not my proudest moments. It didn't do you any good. I understand. I get that. But it didn't do you any good for for reasons that I think we should probably talk about as far as, you know, the jury and what was going on in the world. But when you look at that video, when we look at that video, it's it's disturbing. It's clear as day that this guy had intent to end your life. And like you said, you got lucky with the with the malfunction. and anybody who sees that video automatically sees this guy trying to kill you and you trying to survive. And then we get to the point to where it's shown to a jury and your entire case is shown to a jury. And ultimately they don't end up convicting this guy. Um, can you tell yeah. us a little bit about uh, the jury and, and kind of their thought process and what you've seen now that this case is kind of, it's gotten a little bit further away from the case and what you've heard on how the jury was reacting and what they were saying to this situation. Yeah. So there are actually quite a few different facets that come into play for this jury trial. So first and foremost, California assembly bill 3070 played a gigantic role in the acquittal. We obviously didn't find out about that until we pulled the jury after the verdict was read, but California Assembly Bill was introduced January of last year, and what it did was take away the preemptory challenge questions for law enforcement out of the prosecution and the defense. And what that means is when you are a potential juror, you're asked a slew of questions. And one of those big questions is, do you have any bias towards a specific group like religion, sex, ethnicity, what have you? Well, prior to this bill, law enforcement was protected. And this bill took that away. So now if you have implicit bias towards law enforcement, you're allowed to sit on a jury. And five out of 12 of my jurors expressed this implicit bias towards law enforcement and myself. And one of the jurors afterwards even said, I was, I was selected as an alternate. And I was basically saying, I do not like cops. I've had bad interactions. Do not pick me. I am not impartial. They picked her anyway. She ended up sitting as a primary juror which, you know, California Assembly Bill 3070 completely violated my Marcy's Law rights and my Sixth Amendment right to due process. We're fighting that in another arena right now. But the way that 
the case was presented to the jury was a case of self-defense. It was presented that I, you know, created the exigency, I created the problem, I did not have reasonable suspicion to conduct a detention, I should have just let him go, I never should have approached him. And the jury, as one of their questions when they presented it to the court was, was she able to conduct a search without touching him? And I pondered over this question for quite a while thinking, well, let's just break this down. Say he had a tiny revolver or even a knife in his pocket and I don't do my due diligence of a cop and search him and he goes and he stabs or kills his mom, then that's on me because I didn't do my job. The jury wanted me to search his person with x-ray vision without touching him. So that was a problem for them that I even went hands on with this suspect. And, you know, you guys are a training company, you know it more broad than I do, but reasonable suspicion is a very low standard. And I set, you know, the precedent of reading the standards from the police officer standards and training. There's an entire part that they teach you in the academy of what reasonable suspicion is. And it's a 911 call for service, a suspect acting with, you know, furtive movements or, you know, being in a high traffic area or being involved in criminal activity or believing that criminal activity is about to occur. So me responding to that house with a 911 call gave me all the reasonable suspicion I need, but the defense attorney was able to word it in a way where he was in self-defense. So him taking my gun from me was legal. This is disturbing. It is. The more you hear about it, it just, uh, the more details that I hear about it, it, it makes me more and more sick. So for some of the people that are listening to the podcast, when we talk about uh, this situation with Megan and her showing up on scene with the information that she had, the question poses, was she able to basically detain this person at that time. And the thing we need to detain somebody is reasonable suspicion. And there are cases um, throughout the U S Supreme court that hasn't necessarily outlined a direct percentage of information, if you will, to tell us when you're right at reasonable suspicion, but there's been a lot of cases that kind of give us an idea on what they think is reasonable suspicion. A case that comes to mind right off the bat is a a pretty popular case that we talk about all the time, which is us VR Vizu. And it's basically, you know, not a situation that you had, but it's a a situation where an officer with a border patrol um, observed a suspicious vehicle uh, along the border and observed quite probably about three or four things that he put together in the totality and equaled that up to reasonable suspicion and ultimately conducted a traffic stop, which is a detention on this car. And Ninth Circuit initially said, hey, you know what? He can't, there's no way he's reasonable suspicious based on this. It gets sent up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And they take all the factors that he listed, which honestly is not a lot compared to you know what we've seen in the past. And they do a basically a reasonable suspicion analysis on this case and decide whether or not Agent Stoddard had reasonable suspicion. And they said, yes, he had reasonable suspicion. And he had listed things on there such as, you know, the kids in the back were waving to him, you know, somewhat awkwardly for five minutes. You know, that was a small thing that equaled in total the totality. He talked about how their knees were sitting up higher in the back seat as if they could have had their uh, feet placed on some type of bundles or drugs that are commonly transported. And there's these small things that ultimately led him to believe he had reasonable suspicion and conducted traffic stop on it. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court said, yeah, that's good. And when I look at your case, Megan, and the totality of the circumstances based on your training and your experience, um, this is just to me is mind blowing that this would be the argument of whether or not you had a reasonable suspicion uh, in this matter. Because based on everything you have, the nine one one phone call, uh, the priority one response, uh, the phone going dead, some type of commotion in the back, plus the way that he approached you in that manner, we're there. We're there. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, just mind blowing. And I remember thinking to myself, and I'm sure I said this during my three days of cross examination was what more do I need? So Mm -hmm. you're telling me as a police officer with, you know, the power of arrest and the authority to conduct a criminal investigation, say that this suspect had just murdered his mom inside. So I respond and I just stand at the door and, you know, knowing what I know, the totality of the circumstance, like you said, and I don't do my job and say he's in the commission of hurting someone or he runs out the back and now we have a fleeing felon. Now we have even more problems it's a residential area what if he goes and you know breaks into a house and holds a family hostage because he just committed a crime so if i don't do my job of investigating if a crime happened then what's the point 
of calling 911? What is the point in calling the cops to your house if I can't investigate what happened? And I remember asking, so would you rather a cop assume the facts? So then now I'm being biased towards a specific person by assuming what happened instead of investigating what happened. You know, just because I placed his hand in the small of his back for probably 12 seconds and pat down his pockets, all I was going to do is ask him to sit on the curb and tell me what happened. Yep. If he wanted right. to leave and he was not a criminal, he can leave. He is not in handcuffs. He's not in the back of my car. I'm not, you know, driving to jail. I have no probable cause declaration in my brain. I'm literally trying to figure out if a crime happened and where they need help. And I think if we look at this in hindsight, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I don't even think this was a criminal matter. I think this was a civil matter. Mom wanted him gone. I obviously, I can't kick him out. It would need to be a formal eviction. Go to the courthouse, file the paperwork. Done. But the suspect's actions dictated everything that happened from that point on, not the reverse. And that's the part that really sticks with me is the feelings of what type of precedent is this sending, not just for law enforcement, but the community members. Because if you hear this, then now you're allowing the public to create these problems for future incidents. Absolutely. Yeah. The more this gets out and, you know, amongst the public and, and everything, you've got two types of people. You've got the people that hate cops watching this, like looking at this as a win. And then you have people in law enforcement and, and the community that supports law enforcement, like what the heck just happened with our justice system? You know, like this is not how it's supposed to work. Um, it's just absolutely mind blowing. I just, yeah, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So if I didn't do my job and he killed her, but it was in, you know, the act of me not doing my job, then do I lose my ability to do my job? Like, what about that side of it? But that was never considered. That was never an argument. Unfortunately, some other things happened during the trial where evidence was excluded that I'm still trying to get transcripts. Transcripts are very expensive. It's about $11,000 to get the court transcripts from all of this because we're trying to prove that there was bias throughout. And there was really key evidence that the judge determined to throw out on her own behalf. So the suspect waived his Fifth Amendment right. He wanted to speak and he gave more explicit details about trying to kill me than I gave. He said he wanted to kill me. He tried to kill me. He knew I was a cop. No female tells him what to do. He would kill a cop again. And the judge did not allow that interview to be played in court because it was too short notice after anesthesia, which there is no ruling for anesthesia. It's your best judgment. Obviously, you know, 30 minutes in the PACU probably isn't a good idea. But 24 hours, I mean, we take, we take admissions from people under drugs and alcohol. Why would we not take it in a medical setting that has been cleared by an anesthesiologist? So, you know, there was... There was very damning evidence that the judge determined on her own without asking a professional. And I think that was another realm that the jury did not get to hear. Oh my gosh. It, just gets, it gets, gets worse as we go. Yeah. Oh. I, we could talk about this for days. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So tell us about afterwards. How have you been? How are things, you know, affecting you and what's the plan from here on out? Well, I medically retired for PTSD March of 2022. I was not deemed fit for duty anymore, which was a hard pill to swallow. I knew in the depths of my heart that I could not do this job anymore, but I wasn't ready to give it up. I felt like I was an embarrassment to the department. It was an embarrassment to myself and the profession, but I knew it was the best interest of myself. So I retired and I had many mental health struggles. I went through, you know, basically every avenue of mental health therapy you can. And I am on the other side of things, you know, mental health is not linear. We have, you know, days that are worse than others. But after the trial happened May of this year, I remember getting a phone call because I wasn't there when the verdict was read. My husband and I took our family out of town because I just could not be there. We had some indicators that things were not going well. So I kind of said, you know, I don't want to even hear it for myself. Let's leave. So we are out of state and my sister was there for the verdict reading. And after I received the you know notification that he was acquitted on all charges and he was only found guilty of a misdemeanor, no probation, freed from custody the next morning. I said, uh, excuse my language, this is bullshit. This is not 
going to be the end of my story. And if, if I can't get justice through the justice department, I'm going to go find it myself. So that's when I went public and I was very fortunate to get some news companies that believed in my story, NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, they all were very supportive and wanted to share my story. And that's where this kind of snowball effect of, I hate the word advocate because I feel like that's not, I don't know. It's like one of those buzzwords that, you know, like what's an advocate, but my story is singular in my details, but I talk to officers from across the country every day where these similar things are happening to them. If it's not directly influenced by 3070, it's the public pressures, it's political reasons, it's, you know, organizational betrayal. They're not getting support in their own department. So I said, well, what can I do? I'm just going to talk because I get a pension, not a paycheck. I'm not worried about being blacklisted by my department. I don't work for them anymore. I'm going to be honest and I'm going to stand up for people because there's people that still have to do this job. So that's where I've kind of found my new purpose is, you know, I go and I go across and I speak to different conferences and speak on behalf of legislation reform, political reform. I speak for victim advocacy groups, just trying to bridge the gap between mental health and first responders. And then the other side of, you know, law enforcement reform, we've seen a huge shift in the last couple of years. And I think we got to do something about it. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you turned this into a positive uh, as much as you possibly could. But if if it weighs or if it holds any weight for us to say, um, you, you mentioned that you felt somewhat embarrassed for yourself and for your agency and for law enforcement in general. When I watched that video, I don't get that vibe. Um, and and me and Al have talked about it. Al doesn't get that vibe by any means whatsoever. No, I I. I want to stop you right there and just tell you, Megan, I'm touched, uh, deeply touched by your story and you're a hero. I don't care what the courts say. I, I truly believe that this is, this is, this is what law enforcement is all about. Right. This is somebody that's willing to do everything they can to not pull the trigger, to not hurt somebody, to not abuse their powers. And yet you took the front of it at, in the assault and then you took the public beating to the point where where it cost you uh, your your profession, your job, and I'm sure it took its toll on your personal life. And and please don't be embarrassed. Please don't yeah. feel like for a minute that you have it, that it's an awkward or bad thing. It's terrible that it happened. To you let me rephrase that. But for to be embarrassed or to to feel like we as law enforcement look down on you or you know this terrible thing that happened to you, you are a hero. And uh, I mean, I have never been touched by such a story in my life. My goodness. And it gets worse the longer we go. But I'm just telling you, it's like I sit here for most of the podcast speechless. I'm in awe. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you're here today, the the willpower that you have to drive forward and to be heard and and to bring some kind of justice to, even to others. Again, your service, your service to others um, by speaking by being there to understand, to bridge the gaps. I mean, I, I don't even know how to say it. It's it's amazing what you're doing. Well, and I am really touched. Let me ask you this, Alan. You're 30 years. Have you seen anything like this? I've never seen anything like this. 30 years in law enforcement. I've never seen anything like this, and I've never heard a story like this. Like, I'm deeply touched. And I got to be honest with you. I mean, it's just I'm looking at you. And I don't know that I could do it. Like, I like to consider myself kind of a tough guy, but holy cow. I mean, to be able to recover from something like this and 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 push forward. And you're, you, I'm sure you have support from your family and your husband and the people that gather close to you and that you hold close. But I, I got to tell you, I mean, this is amazing. Your story is profound. And, and I... I I don't know where I've been. I mean, I heard about it, but I had, I mean, I feel so touched. It's yeah. uh, well, now that I'm crying, <laughs> thank you. I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't about me anymore. And I remember that was the first thing I said on social media when I posted, this isn't about me. My road to justice is over. My profession is over. There's nothing there for me. This is for everybody else that still has to wake up tomorrow morning and put on the vest and kiss their family goodbye and not to get all cliche but it's already a thankless job we don't need the justice system turning their back on us as well you know we work hand in hand with the district attorney's office we work hand in hand with law and order 
it's not fair to uphold these standards for everybody else and then not allow those standards to be there for us. And that's something that I just have really struggled with is, you know, I hate to go on this tangent because it's not even important, but women in law enforcement already have it hard enough. We already have to prove ourselves even more. We already have to prove ourselves on patrol, working at a dangerous station. On the other side, law enforcement already has to prove itself even more so. You know, body-worn cameras are not enough for the public anymore. Audio accounts are not enough anymore. Being murdered in the line of duty is not enough anymore. So we have to be outspoken and take it back. Otherwise, this job is not going to be what anybody signed up for. And I think obviously we're seeing that with the retention rates and you know, unfortunately, the suicide rates have completely exploded. And I think it's just up to little old people like me that can't do it anymore to at least try. What's up, everybody? I want to take just a second here and remind all LEOs who are listening to this podcast to get signed up for the LEO Network. Owned and operated by a full-time LEO, this platform is built for you. Discounts in police gear, largest LEO training calendar available, course recommendations, and a lot more. Training companies, LEO Network handles all the certificates for your attendees and has some of the best features coming out. They'll make your job a million times easier. Check them out at leonetwork.com. The pressure from the media on everything is is painting this picture that people like you and I or Al and I, because we wear the badge and the uniform and we do this job, that we're not human. Right. Nobody knows that Megan has a family to go home to, that Megan has kids to go home to, that I have kids to go home to, and that this job isn't our life, that we are human. And the media has been painting this picture for years about how we're just these terrible people and everything that we do is scrutinized. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Matt Mattingly um, and -hmm. his book. Are you familiar with him in 10 Seconds in the Dark? And I recently discovered his story where he d- he gives us his account of the Breonna Taylor shooting. And another one that I'm completely dumbfounded at because the only information that I had of that shooting came from the media. That was it. And I believed everything that the media said, which shows what a dumbass I am at the end of the day. <laughs> and when you hear Matt tell us the story, you learn that 90% of the bullshit the media was giving us it was, was just that. It was yep. false. It was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And that has a huge influence on the public who ultimately ends up being jurors in cases such as yours. And then you have this bill 3070 that comes out and eliminates the question of, do you hate cops or not, or whatever it was. And that's a huge factor in a lot of this too. And it's, it's disheartening as a police officer and the, the story is being told, but not from us, from right. everybody else. And we can't get it out there. So for right. you to, you know, take this upon yourself and go out there and tell your own story, which I'm very grateful you are because the public needs to see this and, how crazy this 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 is yeah i was fortunate enough to meet john mattingly last month at a conference and i heard his debrief and you know it's disgusting that the court of public opinion weighs more than law and evidence and unfortunately you know it cost people lives it cost people's careers it cost people's reputations and i think it's amazing the resiliency that he has to go across the nation and, and educate people on how we need to wait for evidence before we formulate opinions. And in my case, the jury had said at the close of the verdict, you know, what did Megan expect to happen? She signed up for this job. She knew that she could be killed. Like, sorry, but you're not a victim in our eyes. And I think that is just the most asinine description of an occupation. Like, yes, we all sign up with the inherent risk that there may come a time where we could be assaulted or shot at or shot we all know that but it's no different than the inherent risk of getting a driver's license and driving a car like we all know we may get sideswiped by a dui driver but that doesn't mean we go out there and we just you know don't put our seatbelts on and we drive 150 miles an hour everywhere and we run red lights because you know what like we might get into car accident it's not fair it's not right i had you know like you said i had at the time just one daughter and when I was in the midst of my shooting and I remember being in the thick of it, all I was thinking was I am going to die and who is going to pick up my daughter from kindergarten. That was what I was thinking. Like, yes, is it not tactical of me? Sure. You know, I can take whatever they want to say, 
Was I thinking about my training? Of course I was. But at some point, your central nervous system says, oh shit, this isn't going good. Like back to reality of being a human and protecting yourself. And that's where my thought was, was who was going to tell my daughter that I died? And the jury did not care. They did not connect. Half the time there was a juror that took a nap the whole time. He wasn't even present. So it's more than just, you know, a badge and patches. Like you said, we can do all the training. We can invest in ourselves all we want. But if somebody has evil intent, you know, you hope that there's somebody out there that will at least have your back. Definitely. Absolutely. How, how has your agency been or your past agency with the situation? Yeah, my agency was, they were fine. I wouldn't say I would give them like an A plus rating. I wouldn't, you know, classify it any way. I don't want any of this to come across as like pity me or, you know, shame on my agency. I think there's lessons to be learned. And that is one of the reasons why I go and I speak. I just spoke last week to, you know, a group of executives, chiefs and sheriffs and deputy chiefs on how we can take what happened to me and actually use it for good. Like not every critical incident has to be this like trauma vomit. Like I don't want to come and just speak like, oh my God, this story sucks. And I leave you like in your stomach. Like we can grow from this. We can learn training aspects from this. We can learn department organizational things from this. So my department, there was a few things that I wish would have been done differently. I wish I would have had an advocate throughout trial. You know, I wish that I would have had somebody from my agency there with me, but you know, lessons learned. The only thing we can do is move onward and upward and hopefully it, it corrects something. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, they can learn from this as well. Uh, from your experience and maybe fix some things. And if it happens again or something similar, they can uh, do it a little bit different and in a better yeah. way. Exactly. I mean, I think that's one of the beautiful things about this modern day technology is we can learn from things like we don't have to just Monday morning quarterback incidents and say like, Oh, that was crappy tactics. Like we can say, okay, well that didn't work. What can we do better? It's no different than my case. Mine just has to be my brain and the aftermath. Like we can say, Hey, listen, Megan, obviously we fell short in this area, but we've implemented this to take care of that. Well then great. Lesson learned, problem solved On to the next. Absolutely. Right. Well, that's a strong, strong mindset to have Megan to see that you're uh, taking this in that light and saying, Hey, what can we learn from this? What can we do better? And then I really like the fact that you said you show up to speak and it's not all about me. You know, I'm not going to make this a traumatic event, but what can we learn from this situation? Because that's the most important thing to do is look forward and figure out where we can fix ourselves, our mistakes and how we, we make it better. And I will tell you just, you know, again, in my perspective of seeing everything from the beginning to the end, as far as at least the video and in speaking with you, um, that I don't see a whole lot of officers doing anything different than what you did. And I think you did it right. Um, in this situation, I would agree. I mean, this is my opinion. I know it doesn't matter. But as somebody who really digs deep into what reasonable suspicion is, that that it was there, and it's unfortunate that that was the one of the deciding factors of this terrible. It's just another case where, I mean, we see it all the time in in other types of crime and trial. But we they they take and they move the focus to something, and they paint a picture, and they they just keep throwing enough shit, excuse me, till that sticks to the wall. You know what I mean? And in this particular case, they kept on that. They kept harping about the reasonable suspicion. It was there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I would do anything different. Uh, you're there. You're there to investigate. You're there on a nine one one call. I mean, you have all the things that put you there. You're there lawfully, and um, they can say what they want, but in the end, you did what you were supposed to do. Absolutely. Thank you. And your opinion does matter. So <laughs> I appreciate, you know, you saying that and for you guys taking this on and, and educating your audience about it. Cause again, I think it's important, you know, we're seeing a huge shift of law doesn't matter. It's opinion. And I don't think that's right. And I think if we can make enough noise and bang on enough drums, we can get that pendulum swing in the other way. And if anybody here is from California Go talk to your local POA and ask if they know about Assembly Bill 3070, because unfortunately, in 2025, it's going to be implemented in civil trials, which means those federal use of force cases, unlawful, unlawful deadly force, 14th Amendment violations. And I think we're going to be seeing the other side of police being defendants in cases and it not going their way and people ending up in prison. So go talk to your unions and educate them, because I don't think people know about this. 
I think you're right. And I think it's, it's going to grow from there. I mean, California always seems to lead the nation in, in different things. And yeah. if it's there in California, it could spread. I mean, it'll be another, other uh, state soon. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Megan. We appreciate you being on this. This story is again, I say this over and over, just unbelievable. Megan, it was an honor to meet you and thank you for coming out, out to speak with us. And again, you are a hero. Um, you did an amazing job with this whole thing and the fact that you're still out there fighting you're a warrior thank you thank you very much thank you guys so much i appreciate it